There we go. Sorry, I'm just finding the right slides. Um, can everybody see that, the slides? Is that okay? I was trying to get them to be on the slide show, you know, from the beginning rather than seeing all the next ones coming, but I can't seem to do that. I don't know why. Um, yeah, it is. But if that's okay, if that doesn't bother anybody, that's fine. I'll get going. Well, thank you so much, John and Chris, um, for inviting me to speak and for organising a really, really interesting day. Um, so I'm talking about stay home stories, everyday life in pandemic times. And these are all the um, different colleagues who are on the project. And also just a particular thanks to our community researchers in London and Liverpool who conducted quite a lot of our interviews in both places. Uh, there's lots more information on our website. Um, and please do also follow us on Twitter if you'd like to do so. So the home has been at the forefront of political and public health responses to, and also people's lives during the COVID pandemic. National directives to stay home, alongside border closures and other restrictions, limited local and transnational mobility to an unprecedented extent, particularly during periods of lockdown. But of course, people experience the impact of this universal directive to stay home in very different ways, as explored by a growing body of work on home and everyday life during the pandemic. And this work spans and I'm just showing some images from different media articles to illustrate the range of ways in which COVID impacted on home. Um, this work spans home working and homeschooling, the rise of domestic violence and abuse, the impact of the pandemic on migrant domestic workers, digital connectivity or lack of it at home, the effects of housing precarity and housing conditions on mental health, well-being and domestic life, and religious faith and practice at home during the pandemic. Based in London and Liverpool, Stay Home Stories is a collaborative project at the Centre for Studies of Home, which is a partnership between Queen Mary, University of London and the Museum of the Home, and also with the University of Liverpool, the Royal Geographical Society and National Museums Liverpool. And there are three strands to the project, um, which I'm not going to talk through in any detail, but just to show you uh, a sort of summary about each of them. The first one around documenting home, um, thinking about how stay home has been represented and reimagined, but also contested in political debate and media coverage, and working closely with the Museum of the Home around their collecting project, which has over 500 contributions, uh, and also working with artists and other creative practitioners, including our artists in residence. And this image is from Allah's work. Um, which was a room installation at the museum. Uh, secondly, and this is the area I'm particularly focusing on today, as a strand on practicing home, um, and we had interviewed uh, around 120 people in London and Liverpool from different ethnicities, from different faiths, and from different migration backgrounds, focusing on, as you can see, home migration and ethnicity, and also home and religion. And the image here is um, the really wonderful Eid textile Eid quilt um, developed by Women at Praxis with the artist Teresa Hare Duke. And part of our project, we, we co-produced a film and I've added the link here. And you can see all of the films and all of the other outputs from our project, the podcasts and so on, um, on our website. And then the third strand is around mapping home. And this is really led by colleagues at Liverpool, um, which is a nationwide project involving maps by children and young people aged between seven and 16 of their home spaces during the pandemic, um, alongside a project based in Liverpool, analyzing narratives alongside maps. Um, and just, you know, they have over 300 maps as part of this collection now. And the one I've chosen here to illustrate this strand of work is one by a British Bangladeshi year seven pupil in London. So aged either 11 or 12 um, and their map of home in the context of the pandemic and thinking about how homes positioned to all the other places outside home that were significant, that access was then limited to. And you can see that's on a local scale, it's the neighborhood, it's the cousin's house, it's the primary school, it's the cinema, but also it's very much with a sense of a connection to Bangladesh, even at a time when it wasn't possible to visit Bangladesh. So that sense of, again, home expands, even at a time of confinement, home expands beyond the domestic. So it's not confined within the space of the domestic, it extends to the neighborhood, to the city, to the nation and to other places beyond as well. So what I want to do today is first of all, explore questions of mistrust in the context of the pandemic and how this intersected with experiences of racism and the hostile environment for migrants. 
Um, and as I'm sure many of you, I'm sure know, but the term hostile environment was first used by the Conservative government in 2012 and underpinned their immigration policy. Since 2018, the government's tried to use the term compliant rather than hostile environment, although um, as I and I'm sure many others would say that environment is in many ways more hostile than ever. Um, and secondly, I want to draw out the importance of neighbourhood and community in fostering trust and support. And I'm going to end by very briefly outlining a couple of policy recommendations from our research for a fairer future. So living in a hostile environment, our research, um, as well as much other research, demonstrates the heightened racism as a direct result of the pandemic. Regalio spoke about a weird perception that people of colour are the ones who brought COVID here. Francis was afraid to leave the house because of corona racism, and Yong Suk spoke about the strength of anti-Asian and specifically East Asian racism. When the pandemic started, apparently even before the spread in the UK started, there was a huge anti-China, anti-Asian racism. It was so tense. I experienced it everywhere, basically. No one wants to stand next to me. And in the packed bus, no one wants to sit next to me. It was really visible. It was subtle, but visible kind of aggression every day. And this was clearly compounded by wider context of and also beyond the pandemic, including disproportionate health mortality impacts on people from minority backgrounds and an increased focus on race and public discourse, particularly around the Black Lives Matter movement. For Alia, I think being an ethnic minority during this time was particularly hard. There's been some really difficult things to watch over the news over this also, and a lot of conversations have started as a result around racism and everything. But I think it's definitely difficult. And then also seeing that ethnic minorities have been disproportionately affected by COVID as well was a bit of a hard pill to swallow. Our interviews also revealed the vulnerabilities surrounding immigration and asylum services. Several participants working for migration welfare and community groups spoke about the impact of the slowdown of home office decisions on asylum and visa applications and the difficulties this caused both for people waiting for a response and for the ability of organizations to support them. Raya, working at Hackney Migrant Centre, voiced these frustrations very clearly. In her words, the wheels of the Home Office, which are incredibly not round and rusty and slow, ground about 100 times more slowly during the pandemic. So people are not getting responses to their applications, whether it's for asylum, whether it's other applications. And so all that slowed down because the government, the government practically shut up shop or people work from home. I wouldn't expect a very inefficient system in an office to improve when it starts being home-based. The longer term context of the hostile environment continue to shape pandemic experiences for many people. Under this regime, life had already been made harder for undocumented people through policies that reduced available support as well as work, health and housing opportunities. With COVID reducing these opportunities still further, those without legal status found themselves in critically precarious and dangerous situations, less able to find work and unable or fearful to access healthcare in the middle of a public health crisis. Working with undocumented migrants through Citizens UK and Tower Hamlets, Afsana spelt out the catalogue of exclusions facing many people. They couldn't claim benefits. They could not get food. They were not registered on the NHS. They couldn't have vaccination. They were scared if they go to the NHS that might actually deport them because the NHS is connected with the Home Office. So these all started during COVID and people came to also realize that of course, all this injustice connects to one another. Migration support staff talked about the particular problems with a no recourse to public fund status. Um, for both people who are undocumented, but also those who've been granted leave to remain. Regalio, who was still waiting after two years for a decision on his asylum application at the time of interview, spoke about the difficulties of finding work during the pandemic and new risks that any likely work would bring. We don't have recourse to public funds and we need work. Even if there is lockdown and we have to find ways on how to make money, we don't have government support. If we're going to work, the only work available for us are those who are more prone to get the virus, like waiter, you know, in the hospitality industry and cleaners. The intersecting connect consequences of the pandemic on work, health and state support combine to impact most harshly on those already struggling to survive in a hostile environment. 
Intensified racism and racialized structural vulnerability helped to create new levels of fear and mistrust for many of our participants, from wariness about police COVID checks to fears of deportation. Once breaking lockdown became a criminal offense, Kate's organization, which works with newly arrived displaced young people, had to make sure that they were giving very careful advice. As she said, obviously police interaction with our young people comes with many, many layers. Most organizations underlined a lack of trust among the people they were helping. As of Sana in the early quote showed, much of this wariness focused on healthcare services. Mariko, working for the Southeast and East Asian Center, underlined the severity of this fear um, and its consequences for the people they support. People were really frightened about not just getting COVID, but if I get COVID, I can't go to hospital. And if I go to hospital, they will find out about me. So there's a lot of fear around that as well. People had to make choices, work and might get COVID and might get find out, found out by home office because they get tested or they get treatment at the hospital, things like that. It was really emotionally difficult. And of course, in extreme cases, because of that fear, we had a few people who suddenly died at home, not being able to call 111 or to get any emergency services. So far from helping people to come together and create a national sense of unity, a wider hostile environment and other, including policing policies, actively undermine trust, social cohesion and public health in London, Liverpool and far beyond. So I want to turn now to the second part about neighbourhood and community. In the face of such challenges, the pandemic also revealed the importance of neighbourhood relationships and community support. Winnie, for example, found that her building's WhatsApp group created a very nice kind of community spirit looking after each other. For some people who'd migrated to London or Liverpool, opportunities for local connections strengthened their sense of the neighbourhood and community as home. As Farah explained, I really loved the community around, which made me feel like with all the mutual aid things, like neighbours helping each other, I think that made me feel like a part of the community. And it does feel like home. It made me also think that home is more like a feeling than a place. Community organisations and faith groups played significant roles in providing trusted neighbourly contact and support for local people. Saba, for example, spoke about the role of her mosque in Liverpool in supporting people. If a tragedy happens or an adversity happens or something good happens, your faith kicks in. Uh, your faith comes in, kicks in, you know, in one way or another. So the mosque set up a support group for all of its congregation and WhatsApp group so they can keep an eye on each other. They also looked after their neighbors, whether they were Muslim or non-Muslim. When COVID happened, because everybody had to pull together, I like we knew exactly what the Pakistani community was doing, what the Somali associations were doing. We all got to hear what was going on in the community. Whilst community and faith-led initiatives provided an important source of trusted care and support during the pandemic and helped people to feel more anchored in their neighborhood, They've often developed in the absence of state provision and because of long-standing inequalities that were themselves further deepened by the pandemic. Julie, for example, who volunteered at a food bank into our hamlets throughout COVID, described how the pandemic exacerbated existing problems of poverty and austerity. Even before the pandemic, because of austerity and poverty, lots of local people have needed the food bank and that's increased over the pandemic and not having resources to support them has meant that they've had to rely on mutual aid and community support. And I think one of the good things is that we've all found ways to either be supported or support people in our communities whenever there's been need. It's obviously important to recognize that not everyone experienced equal access to support or opportunities to participate. For example, Francis, who lives in East London, felt isolated by the lack of support for East Asian communities and queer people of color in his local area. For Miriam, who felt lonely in her home and neighborhood in Liverpool, I thought there would be a greater sense of community, but no, there was no communications with neighbors. My neighbors can be shy or whatever. I say hello, they never say hello back, and that didn't change in lockdown. I thought they'd want to create a greater sense of community or at least familiarity, but that didn't happen. So my only contact is with a friend of mine that lives in the building next door, and that didn't change. Regalio, who moved to the UK from the Philippines in 2018, described the temporary nature of London and distinguished between home 
and a dwelling place. He said, London is a dwelling place. It's not home, it's a dwelling place. It's a provisional space where I can put my body. It's nothing permanent because of the dominant culture of disdain for migrants or suspicion for migrants and people of color in this country. In similar terms, Yong Suk described London as a transitional city where many residents, whether born in the UK or elsewhere, were not in a position to see London as their permanent home ground. Whilst Yong Suk felt that she hadn't belonged in London before she moved back to South Korea some years ago, she felt more at home once she moved to Hackney in East London on her return, in large part by building a community within the Asian diaspora and with other creative practitioners. As Yong Suk says, it creates a sense of home, but also it gives you power. It gives you resilience power. You have a power to be resilient against any problems directing to this community. I think that that really helps to build a sense of home or making home. It's both ways. It's not just inward way, it's also outward way. How can you be strong in who you are and with your culture in this world? To be able to be who I am with the non-Asian people that I want to coexist together, I need to have the strength and resilience. Some of our participants felt a greater sense of connectedness to their neighbors and neighborhood than before the pandemic, whilst others felt increasingly isolated or excluded. The reasons for such differences were attributed to the nature of the neighborhood, the presence or absence of a sense of community and experiences of racism and a hostile environment. In each case, however, people's experiences of neighborhood and community during the pandemic, whether positive, negative, or a mix of the two, were closely bound together. And I want to end by briefly drawing out two policy recommendations for a fairer future. <clears throat> and I should say, um, we've recently launched a report about our research in London, um, which includes uh, more policy recommendations. We've also done an earlier report about COVID and Liverpool, um, as well as, as other reports. We've got a report we're launching shortly about um, a resource guide for people of different faiths and none uh, in terms of the future. But the two um, points I want to really end with, um, the stay home directive in the UK and elsewhere <clears throat> was a key political and public health response to the COVID pandemic. But the clarity of this directive masked the inequalities and complexities of people's lives. Inequalities that predated the pandemic were further exacerbated by it, notably in relation to the quality and security or insecurity of housing, racism, and the challenges facing migrants, refugees, and asylum seekers. I'd like to end by drawing out these two insights <clears throat> to inform post-pandemic recovery agendas on both local and national scales that seek to make homes and neighborhoods fairer and more livable for all. So the first point is around understanding people's home lives and also their sense of home beyond as well as within the household or the domestic dwelling. So not wanting just to limit an idea of home to think about the dwelling place and the domestic sphere should be at the heart of urban placemaking and neighborhood planning. And this connects closely with the need to address long-term housing inequality and precarity and the importance of prioritizing adequate space for home working and access to domestic and also neighborhood green space in future housing policies and developments. And one strand that came through really strongly from the maps um, by children and young people was just how vital it is for children and young people to have some space that they can call their own, some space for their own sense of autonomy, their own sense of self. So that, that's something that I would add to that one. And then secondly, community migration and faith organizations have provided vital local support during the pandemic and a key for post-pandemic recovery. Uh, we re recommend strengthening coordination, communication and consultation between government and on the ground organizations, prioritizing core funding for translation services and digital training and access, and creating structures within and across community and faith groups to support leaders. And particularly in this context, um, particularly those working primarily alone. So I shall leave it there, but thank you very much. And I'll stop sharing now. Great, thanks so much, Alison. 